Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, um, Ellie Wheeler, who is a partner at Graycroft. Um, Ellie has vast experience when it comes to choosing investments. She's also worked at Lowercase Capital, um, and she's also worked in corporate development at Cisco, corporate development and acquisitions. She is graduated magna cum laude from Georgetown and also received her uh, HBS degree. So Ellie, take it away. All right. Oh, well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, just so I get a sense, how many founders do we have? All right. And how many other people are in kind of startup ecosystem or tech? Okay. All right. Cool. So I'm going to try and get out of the way of this while still looking at it. Um, I'm going to fly through this. So it'll be a little bit context about me, a little bit about Graycroft, and then kind of a little inside baseball. So how does it actually work at Graycroft when we're looking at your company? Um, there's some other stuff, but I'm going to fly through it because I think the questions will be more fun. All right, this is me. So I'm a partner at Graycroft um, from Massachusetts, but obviously live here. This is a, a few things, a few places I've been. Started off at Summit Partners, which is a generalist private equity firm in Boston. Moved out to the Valley, was at Cisco for a few years, doing M&A venture strategy on the enterprise software side. Went back to business school. Um, started doing a whole bunch of early stage stuff there, and then landed at Graycroft thereafter, where I've been for a little over seven years. All right, what's Graycroft? So we're actually a multi-stage venture fund. Right now we are um, investing out of two funds, our fifth early stage fund, which is 250 million. That's gonna take you from $100,000 to five or six million as an investment from us. Um, and then we've got a growth vehicle, which we're at our second one, that's 350, a little bit more concentrated. Uh, so that's gonna be 10 to 35, and it picks up where the early stage fund leaves off. That Half of that capital goes into existing portfolio, uh, the other half into more greenfield opportunities, things that we wish we had done at the A, but for whatever reason didn't, um, and then we try to get into them later. Um, we are, we've got a fairly broad mandate, anything internet or mobile enabled, uh, and the portfolio is about 50% B2B, 50% B2C, and as I said, fairly wide ranging within that. I personally spend my time about half consumer, broadly defined, about a third digital health scenario where I've been spending a lot more time uh, over the last 18 months, and then I've got a little bit of a miscellaneous bucket. Um, yeah, as I said, we're, New York, we're in New York and LA, we're still, and we've we're founded in 2006. We're still the only fund that are, that, that are exclusively in those two markets, which I still find interesting. Obviously, a ton of growth in both of those markets, and we're, we're very excited about more to come. And we're one of the most active investors around. I think we were number eight last year globally just in terms of activity. Uh, so we're, we're doing a lot. Cool. This is kind of how we operate. It's a little bit different. Um, we don't have hard and fast rules around a lot of things. So the, the first point is we always syndicate. So there's always another fund in around with us. That means um, there's never a case where there's a $5 million round and we are doing all five. Um, so we can, we play nicely with others essentially. So we can lead, we can co-lead, we can follow. We do lead in a lot of cases, uh, but we can also join a round that somebody else is leading. Um, we think that that's for a whole host of reasons, which kind of goes into number two. Um, the flexibility, we think, is beneficial to the entrepreneur. So we kind of allow you to get the people around the table that you want um, and also construct the right size round. So we don't have hard and fast rules around ownership percentage or investment amount. So you might hear from some folks it's 20% ownership or, or nothing, and that's not how we operate. Um, so hopefully that enables you to put together the right size round for what you're trying to do to get to the next set of milestones and also get the right set of people around the table. We also don't have uh, taking a board seat as a prerequisite. Happy to be an observer, and that's, again, to kind of give uh, other venture firms what they might need. And also there's kind of diminishing returns to stacking your board with a bunch of VCs who are already going to show up. Um, and then we try to stay small. So our early stage fund is 250. That's right around where it'll stay. The last one was 200. We could have raised a much larger fund, but really want to stay focused so we can continue to execute the same strategy. Um, these are just a handful of recent things, um, both uh, just some, some names that you'll know. 
um, a handful of acquisitions that are recent and some, some of the larger fundings. Um, and then to the good stuff. So how we're actually finding investments. We're looking at a few thousand investments a year. And then we're making maybe 10 to 12 investments that year. Those are core early stage investments. I'm not really talking about the growth fund. I think the orientation is toward early here. Um, that also doesn't include seed, which I'll talk about in a second. So that's mostly kind of series A. There'll be like 10 to 12 a year. Um, the majority of what we're seeing is coming inbound. Um, there's just a lot of noise that comes inbound. And then uh, there's kind of a hierarchy of other introductions. Um, so not every introduction is created equal. So um, the it's just a filter. It's a way for us to kind of prioritize. The very best is an entrepreneur who's made us a ton of money who's invested in you. Um, so that's awesome. And then, you know, kind of goes down from there. But, you know, somebody in our portfolio, that's great too because we've already made a bet on them. Um, and if they're they're recommending you, that that's great. Um, and then you know other investors who are you know your seed investors or your angel investors. Um, but we've done investments from introductions from all over the place, including from your lawyers. I've, I've done at least one that came from a lawyer that I know very well. Um, so it you know there is a hierarchy, but that doesn't mean um, that if you know if you don't get the, the very best, it doesn't happen. That's not true at all. Um, yep, the very best signals, of course, repeat founder that's kind of getting the band back together to go do the same thing with, with better technology. Um, but we certainly back a ton of first-time founders. Uh, but that's obviously, it's going to make the road a little easier if you've already kind of hired and fired and built a business and exited. Uh, but, you know, not, not everyone has done that, and that's totally fine. Um, this is just kind of geographically, we, we do look a little different. So I, this on the right is the, the venture industry dollars um, at large and where they're geographically distributed and deployed. And then uh, this shows where ours are. So essentially a quarter in New York, a quarter in LA, um, only 15% in the Bay Area, um, and then the remainder elsewhere. I should have, on, on the exit slide, it's actually interesting, because a lot of those companies were based kind of all over the place. There was one on there that was based in Birmingham, Alabama. There was one that was based in Salt Lake. Um, so, you know, we're, we're willing to invest wherever. Seed program. Um, we spent a lot of time here. So um, the way that we define it, anything that is under a million dollar check from us, we consider seed. Um, it's just a slightly more streamlined process. So I can make the decision. Um, that you don't have to come in for a full partner pitch. The way that we do it is each partner has an allocation to seed over the life of the fund, and they can deploy it how they see fit, up to a million dollars into any given investment. Um, if I then, so then let's say I put a million dollars into a company, that million dollars goes away from my allocation for that fund. If I then lead the A or participate meaningfully in the A, I get that million dollars back to redeploy. And we think that that kind of leads to the right incentives, which is it's not just making a bunch of small seed bets to wait and see, it's really kind of concentrating time and effort into things that we really think we're gonna be with for a lot longer. Again, this is just a little more on seed, I kind of already touched on this. So this is uh, kind of the flow for how, how things go internally. Um, and the reality is 90% of companies don't really get past the first caller meeting. So that's the initial filter. Um, so it kind of works its way down to that, you know, one to two kind of investments per year per partner. Um, you know, there's a lot of different reasons at different stages why things fall apart. Um, and sometimes it's just bandwidth and timing. I mean, there's, it's a black box fundraising, unfortunately. Um, but I'll go through a few. Um, so there's some common reasons for passing without a meeting, um, and sometimes that's just, you know, the risk reward is a little bit off, it's so nascent, and, you know, the founder isn't even full-time on the company yet, like, that's going to be a little too early for me, there are people who'll do that, but 
I'm going to wait a little bit. Um, oftentimes, it'll be just a market that I don't do. I'm not really going to touch anything that's FDA approved, for example. I'm not really doing devices or drugs. Um, I don't do a ton of hardware. Um, so there's some things that just aren't going to be a fit. And then I'm just getting an awful lot of inbound spam about ICOs, which are also not going to be a fit. Um, or sometimes it's, it's history. The company's actually been around a while. They've raised a ton of money. It's, it's not so compelling that I'm going to spend the time to go recap the business. We're just going to kind of move on. Um, after passing, after the one meeting, sometimes, sometimes it's the team. Um, sometimes you just don't believe and don't think that you know, the right pieces are around the table to really be able to accelerate. Um, sometimes it's unrealistic expectations. So, you know, a company that is, is relatively nascent and just thinks that they're going to raise $20 million and, and, and puts in their slide deck that they expect a $100 million valuation, right? That's, that's going to be, that's going to be an easy one. Um, and uh, I'll typically give them that feedback and, and they may well come back once the market has kind of spoken. Um, so sometimes it's just unrealistic expectations. Uh, other times, you know, we learn a little bit more, realize that the market really is crowded. It's maybe it has winner takes all dynamics and they're behind. So, you know, that one is, could be another example. Or sometimes it's the market. We just don't think it's big enough or attractive enough to get to, you know, a hundred million dollar revenue company. That's kind of how we're thinking about it. Do you have the potential in a, in a reasonable period of time to be able to get to that kind of scale and will the market support it? Um, these would be great things to hear, so kind of been there, done that, we talked about that. Um, telling the story in fundraising uh, to me is also, I mean, it's kind of an unfortunate part of that you're judged on that, but the, but the one thing that it does act as a proxy for is recruiting, right? So if you're, if you're pretty great at, at selling the funding story, you might w well be pretty great at getting people to join you early um, who might otherwise not, who are going to leave the cushy corporate job or are going to leave that awesome growth startup and, and take a bet on you. Um, so that is one thing that it is actually a proxy for. Um, and typically, you know, looking for low paid in capital just, and by that I mean really kind of a test and learn mentality rather and, you know, the ability to focus and say, hey, these are the, the two things that I'm really focused on, on proving out versus you know, raise a bunch of money and try to do a ton of things. That doesn't tend to work particularly well. Um, and then, you know, benchmarks around, um, you know, for a Series A on, on traction, it's typically, you know, 100K of MRR or a million of ARR for a SaaS business, for a commerce business or a direct-to-consumer business, a little bit higher, more like 200, 250K of net per month. Um, the size of seed rounds are increasing, and therefore the milestones for the A are going up too. So these numbers, the 100K, it's, it is going up. But first and foremost, not everyone should actually take venture money. Uh, there's an awful lot of press around it, and you read TechCrunch every day, but there's other options, and for the vast majority of businesses, venture is not actually the answer. Um, there are an awful lot of other options, obviously friends and family rounds, grants, you can even take loans, customers, you can build a business with customer dollars. Um, obviously some types of businesses require venture and for that it can be great. For those that it should not have, it can, it can ruin because the alignment's going to be a little bit off. Um, and the one that I will mention is NDVC, I think it's a pretty cool initiative that a venture guy has kind of spun up which is going after businesses that are bootstrapping and are building it profitably and building it with, you know, kind of small amounts of capital and they're, they're running some cool programming. Um, just a, a few other things. It is time consuming and distracting to be fundraising, so just be intentional about it. Um, it's, it's decently easy to get dragged into a process when you're not ready or maybe don't want to be in a process. Um, the other thing that happens a lot, especially for folks raising around for the very first time, is that they don't necessarily hear the no even when it is a no. Um, so there's a lot of what we would call sometimes happy ears, um, but we do that even within our own portfolio. So I'll, I'll have this conversation with founders that I've backed, really trying to drill into where they are in the process with people. Um, so you might get... 
um, you know, kind of soft nose that maybe you're an optimist and a good salesperson and you think that it's really an opportunity when in fact they're saying no. It's hard to reinvigorate and really get someone excited when they aren't. Uh, you only need to find one person to say yes. So that's what you're searching for, the one who believes. You're not really trying to, to push people who don't across the finish line. Um, other common pitch-related um, issues that we'll see are um, being really dismissive of, of competition. Um, that's just, you should assume that your competitors are intelligent, um, that you're not, in fact, the only one. Um, you know, oftentimes, you just want to have an understanding of how much you get about your industry, how much you've thought about it, kind of go back and forth a little bit about where you see yourself. Um, and you know the the pitch process and you know kind of the the diligence process is as much learning about how we're going to work together and and how you're going to react if I challenge you and vice versa than it is what your very specific answer is. Obviously, I hope that it's great too, but it's it's more you learn a lot in that process and and you should keep that in mind too because it's you're very much in you know I guess the, like the honeymoon period right if it's a bad relationship then it's uh, it doesn't tend to get better so you do learn a lot in the kind of term sheet negotiation as well as through the diligence process so I would you know pay a lot of attention to that um, oftentimes I know that if I have to ask you for the basic KPIs that I expect to see in your business, I know that they're bad. Uh, because if they were good, you would have told me already. They would be on slide two. If you have a chart that exists that is up and to the right, it is early. Um, so oftentimes you, you know that pretty early on. And then I hate the exit slide, um, particularly in early stage companies because, you know, that's first let's build a business. We can worry about that later. Uh, yeah, this is um, just, I'll, I'll fly through this, but there's a lot of money out there, but, and I would say that it's easier than ever to actually get in touch with investors, because uh, there are people, uh, people are fairly accessible, there's a lot of different events, obviously there's a lot of different programs and accelerators and things that you can do to kind of get on the radar, um, but you, know, you should also try and focus your energy on people who are gonna be most impactful, and so you can do a little research. Um, as I said, there's kind of a hierarchy of intros, um, and then kind of maintaining momentum throughout a process with somebody is also key. So finding reasons to check in, finding good news to meet out over the process. And don't oversell the, you know, be, it's, it's a fine line between creating some competitive pressure and kind of an impetus to move quickly. Um, but if you push that too far, it often comes back to bite you, saying I'm getting term sheets tomorrow, so I really need to know and then you follow up with me again a week later, like that's, that's you oversold. Um, this I'm gonna skip because it's a little inside baseball about how rounds are changing. Um, but I will show you a handful of things where we're spending a bunch of time. Um, so FinTech and InsureTech, seeing a lot in insurance and have for the last 18 months. Um, some of it's interesting, some of it isn't, but obviously a big market, regulated market, a uh, little bit slower to move, but big piles of capital. So you're seeing some interesting innovation. We're funding some things that are kind of powering the market as well, which I think is an interesting uh, kind of picks and shovels approach. Um, still seeing a lot in FinTech. Um, healthcare, as I said, I'm spending a lot of time there. Um, the first bucket, D to C, tends to be tied with a product. Uh, I don't really believe in direct-to-consumer care models yet, not in the US, people just, it's not a thing. Um, but you know, kind of next generation commerce, I actually do think is going to be tied with a service. And the f what some of the first examples you're seeing are in direct-to-consumer healthcare, whether it's a Hubble Contacts or Keeps or Roman or Him, something like that. Um, also concierge medicine, I don't really like that word, but what I mean by that is kind of taking the best of consumer and applying it to healthcare. So actually thinking of the patient as the consumer and uh, you know, kind of re-experiencing and re-architecting the experience from end to end as a result. Uh, you, you don't have to necessarily have a B2C pay model to be able to do that. Um, and then we're seeing a lot of different, uh, different things around genomics. 
And then marketplaces, we've done a lot of them over time. We still really like them. There's still a lot of opportunity. Happy to see a lot of B2B marketplaces right now, uh, which are interesting. Tends to take a little bit longer to get up and running in a B2B marketplace, but once the market hits, it can be really sticky. Yeah. And then these are some of the fun things that we're starting to see more and more of. Um, you know, we're, in, we're active in a handful of these markets, but we're also just starting to see uh, more volume in some of these more nascent areas. All right. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Of that course. was wonderful. Thank you. If you want to just take a seat and then we'll I'll oh, go sure. through the slide. Okay. All right. So now we have some of your questions, um, but feel free to keep submitting as I'm going to run through them. Um, so first off, um, someone submitted a question. Um, what is the typical equity stake VCs ask for in New York City? Ah, um, so they won't typically do it like that. Hmm. Um, so you will get a pre or probably a post money valuation, um, or that's at least how we do it, and then a size of round, and you kind of back into what that percentage is. A lot of the time, it's kind of around 20%, um, but it can vary. Got it. Okay. So just going back a little bit, you touched on this a little bit during your presentation, um, not getting too distracted when you're starting your first fundraising round, but when should you start um, looking to fundraise and uh, what steps should you take to get your company ready to go through this process? Oh, um, <laughs> very much depends on the stage of your business, but you know, you, you kind of fundraise when you can. Uh, sometimes if you, if you are getting a lot of interest, that is a good time. Um, you know, other times, if it's very early on, um, there's different ways to approach it. I mean, you can get uh, perhaps a friends and family round or an angel round or some of these things that, you know, I, I threw up there to be able to get you to a prototype or to be able to get you to a product uh, or to be able to get you, you know, to some milestone that will be a bit tangible to the next set of investors as you say, now I'm going to take this, which I already proved to you I could build, and then I'm going to commercialize it or I'm going to launch or I'm going to do whatever the next step is. And that can be more of an institutional round. Um, but, you know, that very first round, um, you know, it's, it is a bit of nuance. John can walk us through it too. So when you do get that meeting with a VC, it can be pretty intimidating, someone said. Um, what are some of the top questions startups can expect to hear from you? Oh, um, so I, it very much depends, honestly. Um, it depends on the business. So typically what I want to hear, though, in a slide deck is, who are you? Um, you know, why are you uniquely suited to solve whatever this problem is? I always like to hear a little bit about the origin story. Like, what, what brought you to this? What, you know, why are you doing this particular thing right now? Um, and then I want to hear what it is that you're building. What is that problem that you're solving? Um, and why, does that pro why is it the right time to be solving that problem? And then why is that problem meaningful enough for the world to care, right? Like, is this actually a big problem that you're solving? Um, that's basically the construct that I'm looking to hear. And so there have been some stories about raising too much too soon. Um, can you share with us your perspective on that? Sure. I think I got at it a little bit, which is just, it doesn't really require you to focus and it can um, mask a lot of ills um, because you don't have to choose and really understand if you have product market fit. So that is, is certainly, you know, a downside. Um, on, the, on the flip side, you can say, well, you get, you've got more time. And that's true, but I've almost never seen a circumstance where a company didn't spend the money they raised. Um, so it's one thing to say, I'm going to raise 10, but I'm really only going to spend five. I've just never seen it happen. You end up spending 10. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's important to not over raise so that you can end up in a really tight spot down the road if you don't actually manage to, to hit the milestones and, and, and be able to accelerate through because you're often paying for what they're going to see in the future. And if you don't manage to hit that, you're just, it's in a, you're in a much tighter spot. 
So, so far, a lot of these questions have been anonymous, but please feel free to give your name if you want as well. Um, but the next one is also anonymous. If having a prototype, uh, is having a prototype a prerequisite before talking to VCs, and can a patent take its place instead? No to a patent. Mm. Um, but can a, not, I mean, may, you can talk to maybe a biotech investor and they might feel differently, but in my land, it, no to a patent. You can't litigate it. It isn't actually something that, you can have an amazing patent, but you won't be able to fight Google, right? Um, and the first question was a prototype. A prototype, yeah. It can be a good thing. If you can do it, it's great to do. Um, but, you know, I've also funded companies without one. So you mentioned drop the exit slide um, yeah. when presenting, but um, someone, another anonymous person asked, when it comes to exiting, if a startup wants to sell for a 5X and not a 20X return on your capital, would a VC stand in the way? Maybe some will. Um, we, as a matter of principle, think that if the founder thinks it's the right time to sell, it probably is, uh, because they know something about the business that is telling them that it's the right time to sell. Uh, so we tend to follow. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when it comes to milestones, what milestones must be met to attract your first round? Is there something? I know it depends. It's very, yeah. I mean, so I gave you um, all, uh, he can talk to seed yeah. and, and incubators. I'll, I'll tell you, like I talked to John at a little bit on series A, so some of the basic benchmarks, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also about momentum. So. Um, you can be at 100K of, of, AR, of MRR, but not growing, and that's not interesting, right? So it's not just about, you know, kind of checking the box. It's also about trajectory because we're trying to see where are you going to be in 18 months and are, you know, you going to take these proceeds and create more value than you're spending every month, right? And, like, that's one way to think about burn rate and the value that you're creating is, you know, when you look back on a month, did I actually create more value than the money I spent? Good question. So um, last one. Um, how do you view founder split of ownership? Even split or not? Hmm, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. um, it depends, which isn't me avoiding the question. Um, but I, I want to understand that there is there has been discussion and there has been thought. 50-50 split, I have a problem with. If one of them, I've, and I've seen this before, one of them is full-time in the business and running it, one of them is not in the business at all. And you're coming at seed and it's 50-50 split between the two founders. That's problematic. That's gonna be problematic early, it's gonna be problematic later. So if it's a 50-50 split, then you know the, the responsibilities also and the time commitment also need to be 50-50 split. Um, and you know, if not, then it should be, should be solved early. Um, but certainly need vesting. So definitely have founder vesting in a founder agreement. Well, thank you so much. That was Thanks. great.